The anime start with our absolute loser of a protagonist named Yuki Wakura complaining about having to clean up every morning at school, his so-called friends that look like characters we will probably never see again have a good laugh. This is because they can take it easy since Yuki is practically Mr. Clean and has unparalleled cleaning skills. Just then, all the girls arrive late to school as always, but the boys can't do anything about it since they are not granted powers like the girls are. Unlike boys, girls are able to gain powers simply by eating peaches, Yuki points out how useless his life is since all boys are playing life on hard mode from the second they are born. Our boy Yuki finds ways to make himself useful though, as one of his buddies asks him to fix a button on his suit like guys tend to do, Yuki pulls out his super manly sewing kit and fixes it up with lightning speed like a human sewing machine amazing all his friends. However, the little nerd points out that his sewing skills don't help him get any ladies, Yuki's older sister taught him how to sew because boys are pretty worthless since they don't receive the benefits of the peaches. She taught him well, but she was pretty abusive about it as she would choke him straight into unconsciousness if he didn't do it right. Yuki's side character friend wonders about his sister but he is told by the other little nerd that it's a sensitive topic. It's almost time for you to start looking for a career but he begins to wonder if that's all there really is to life. Between having to work a dead-end job and all that sewing he does, he will be a riskless dweeb forever. Yuki snaps out of this depressive state of mind and assures himself that there is something more out there, a place where he can make a difference without having to sew a single thing. Just then, the area becomes really foggy and a strong gust of wind pushes him back. When the fog clears, Yuki realizes that it's his worst nightmare, he has appeared in a place called Mado. He begins to freak out and searches for his phone to bring out the Mado instruction manual, Mado refers to an alternate dimension accessible via gateways, also known as doors. These doors suddenly appeared throughout Japan, damages and injuries sustained as a result of monsters known as Shuki entering their world, or civilians accidentally wandering in Mado are referred to as Mado mishaps. This little history lesson is good and all, but what's really important is what he needs to do now. When a civilian finds themselves in Mado, they're supposed to stay wherever they are and wait for the Demon Defense Force to rescue them. The terrified Yuki plans to do just that, but one of these horrifying Shuki appears to attack him, Yuki runs for his life from the monsters that look like they're straight out of bleach, but arrives at a dead end and several more Shuki appear. Yuki determines that he can't sew his way out of this one, so he has the bright idea to throw a rock at the creature. This shockingly accomplishes nothing and just gets it mad, Yuki then imagines what his body would look like after getting sliced up by this thing. He won't be able to sew himself back together but he explains that he doesn't want his life to end this way, the demon isn't listening to his concerns at all as it's about to destroy him, but just then he is saved by a girl riding on a shuki. This girl calls him unlucky for getting a tech so fast and initiates a fight with all the other beasts, she slices a bunch of the low anime budget demons in half with her sword, but she sees that the shuki she was riding just had its arms ripped off. She knew the dumb thing would be too weak so she continues taking care of business on her own, her name is Kyoka Yuzen and she is the commander of the 7th squadron and the demon defense force. She tells Yuki to stay back but he makes himself super useful by pointing out that things are getting worse by the second, Kyoka takes control of one of the Shuki by putting a chain around its neck and the two get out of there, they are chased soon after the Himari, Nei, and Shushu arrive to back up their commander. They report that there are no other survivors so Nei checks their surroundings again, she finds that a horde of the low effort monsters are approaching quickly, so Kyoka tells them to handle it while she takes the boy to safety. The girls instantly handle business as Himari does her best impression of Mega Man and transforms her hand into some kind of Gatling gun to put a bunch of holes in the demons, Shushu won't be outdone though and shows off her ability to grow into a giant like she's one of the Avengers. It becomes pretty apparent to Yuki that of all the girls that are able to get power from Peaches, these girls are the cream of his crop. Yuki has only heard rumors about the demon defense force, but seeing them in action now amazes him. The girls finish up the hollows from Bleach and we see that they found an unconscious boy, they assume that their commander made it back to the dorm already, so they decide to go and check if the last site has been cleared before heading home. The little boy wakes up but instead of being grateful for them saving him, he just looks around for his sister. Elsewhere, we see that the commander hasn't made it back yet and she is busy reminding Yuki about the most important rule, when a civilian finds himself in a matter mishap, they're supposed to keep their mouth shut. Just then, they must stop as they come across a girl that Yuki remembers seeing just before going through the gate, this girl is just about to learn an important lesson from gravity, but luckily she is saved by Kyoka. 
Kyoka's Shuki slave is way too slow so they have to abandon it, and she begins fighting all the demons chasing them, Yuki bravely protects the girl but he must be saved as well. Kyoka quickly raises a barrier and tells them not to wet themselves, but the demons are beginning to break through, things are looking bad even for Kyoka and she begins to think about how she got stuck with a lousy ability. A look into the past, shows some girls gossiping about her, she is known for being strong but her ability sucks and they are certain she will never be supreme commander, Kyoka is determined to prove those dumb girls wrong and vows to one day rule over all the commanders. Time is running out and she thinks about doing something crazy, she has never tested her ability on a man before so she has a serious decision to make. She tells Yuki that she needs something from him in order for them to escape, so of course the little dweeb is eager to do whatever it takes to survive. He doesn't get what he expected though, as Kyoka informs him that he's going to be her slave, the process seems like it might be a little risky however, as Shulka tells the little girl to get out of the way and close her eyes. Kyoka explains that if Yuki had enhanced strength it would have a shot and making it out of there alive, Yuki can't believe that she wants him to fight the demons, but Kyoka manhandles him and reminds him that he said he would do whatever it takes. She then explains that it's time for him to bow down to her, these words hit Yuki like a truck kun and despite never even having touched the girl before, he reacts on instinct. Yuki holds her finger out to him and for some strange reason his instincts tell him to lick it, the second his disgusting tongue touches her probably dirty finger, chains of energy surround him. Immense power bursts out of his body and Yuki transforms into a crazy looking demon, he looks way more powerful now and Kyoka is amazed to see that it actually worked. The other girls arrive and are shocked to see that their commander turned him into her slave, Yuki is insanely powerful as he slices right through a demon and things have worked out way better than Kyoka could have imagined. Kyoka mounts him and commands him to show her what he's got, Yuki then starts ripping all the demons to shreds like a boss, flying through the air and slicing right through all of them like they don't even exist. Kyoka throws in some commands for good measure and she is stunned by how fast he is, Kyoka reunites the little siblings but everyone is startled when the demons start doing some reuniting of their own. The giant lump of demons becomes a huge demon, so Kyoka sends the others home so she can take care of business with Yuki. She commands him to crush the giant so Yuki bursts right through the little rock it was carrying, he dodges all of its attacks and trims a bit off the top of the demon's body. The thing blows up in a huge way leaving all the girls that apparently haven't left yet to wonder who in the world this guy is. Kyoka ends her ability and reverts Yuki back to his very average and plain self. Kyoka declines the other girl's offer to return home like a jerk because she needs to have a very important and secret conversation with her new toy. She reveals that he surprised her, as she never would have guessed at an average Joe like him, had it in him to turn into such a beast, she wants to make his job as her slave a permanent arrangement but that statement alone makes her boy speechless. Before any of that though, there's an important caveat to her ability, she wasn't kidding as she plants a kiss right on Yuki's face, she pretty unfairly calls him a pervert and explains that this is the price of her ability. Since she is the master, she must without exception compensate her slave with a reward. As if that weren't crazy enough, the reward must be one that equals the worker's slave does each time he carries out a task. Yuki's heart is pounding out of his chest and he can't believe that his reward was a kiss. Kyoka explains that he worked really hard out there and shockingly offers to give him another kiss. Yuki freaks out as she has given him plenty to dream about already and declines the offer, he does probably the most awkward thing anyone can do in this moment and accidentally hits her in the face. Kyoka sympathizes with him and explains that she wasn't expecting this situation either, when the Shuki were her slaves, they only wanted slices of pork as a reward. Yuki on the other hand, is a disgusting pervert and she reveals that in these moments, her body moves automatically. Regardless of how she feels about it, it's the price she must pay for her ability so she plants another kiss on him. Afterwards, Yuki makes the dumbest looking face as he is still stunned to have just had his first kiss. Kyoka gets really serious as she explains that if even just one of the Shuki were to appear in the real world, there would be dozens of casualties. Her goal is to become Supreme Commander and exterminate the vile creatures for good, the current Supreme Commander is a loser though and far too lenient, with Yuki's help, she is sure that she can reach her goal so she insists that he work for her. Yuki surprises absolutely no one when he reveals that he isn't good at stuff like sports or academics, all he is confident in is his ability to be a maid and keep a house sparkling clean. That isn't a problem for Kyoka though, as she is all for a dude that knows how to clean. Aside from that though, Yuki showed a lot of bravery when trying to save the girl, even though he was just being a meat shield. Kyoka thinks he isn't too bad for a guy, 
So Yuki finally finds some courage and declares that he wants to be a hero in Mado. Yuki only has a life of monotony and mediocrity waiting for him in the real world. In this world though, he can turn into a monster that looks like something from a cross between Pokemon and Bleach. For the first time ever he feels like he can avenge his sister's death. Most importantly though, the little perb says it will all be worth it as long as he gets his reward from Kyoka. Soon after they go to the Demon Defense Force dorm, Yuki passes through the barrier and prepares to become a prestigious member of the Force. Yuki enters with a completely new outlook on life. He is a totally different man now and he confidently stands before the girls awaiting his introduction. The girls just wonder who the nerd is though and Kyoka just introduces him as the caretaker. She explains that during battle he will be her slave, but at the dorm he is the girl's caretaker. Some of these girls have never even seen a boy before, but Kyoka explains that they are all very skilled fighters. They all have colorful personalities though so their caretakers don't usually stick around for long. Yuki is the perfect fit though because he is as dull as it gets and he is great at cleaning. Yuki is furious since he thought he was going to be on the Demon Defense Force, but Kyoka explains that men are not allowed to join. She instructs the girls to make him feel at home so they waste no time in telling him to do chores. Yuki can hardly keep up, but Nei is the only nice one among them and tells him that everything will be okay. The others are quick to point out that the little girl has superiority over him, so he better not disobey her. Yuki's dreams of having a meaningful life have been shattered as he goes into a deep depression for having to obey the orders of a child. Things might not be so bad though, as Kyoko kindly welcomes him to the squadron. The story continues, we see Yuki proudly finishes up doing his cleaning thing, but thinks about how this scenery doesn't look so great in Mado. Just then, as Shuki that thinks it's being sneaky tries to attack Yuki, the barrier stops the stupid hollow from Bleach and Nei arrives to check if he is okay. She explains that the 7th Squadron is in Mado's unlucky southwest area, that is why more Shuki appeared there than her other dorms. Mado is an alternate dimension that's as big as the city of Tokyo and it's divided into 8 locations, each one also has its own demon defense force. Nei considers herself his teacher but Yuki isn't sure if he can get used to a child being his superior. Yuki ignores that for the moment as he wonders if they should do something about the Shuki that's just been hanging around there awkwardly, but Nei explains that it's just a small fry and they can just ignore it. Himari doesn't agree with her apparently, as she goes all Mega Man on the Shuki and lights it up with her Gatling gun, Yuki is upset that she almost hit them but Himari points out that if she wanted to hit him, he would already be filled with bullets. Himari tells him to get to working on dinner and reminds him that he's only there because of Kyoka. Yuki begins to think that being a caretaker really sucks and he has a strange feeling like he senses someone. That night, everyone raves over Yuki the chef's cooking skills and even the poor attitude Himari wants another serving. He feels great after all the compliments and even keeps a good attitude when they remind him of all his other duties. The dummy gets back to work but finally remembers that he wanted to be a hero, not a handyman. Yuki brings up his concerns about just doing chores all day but Kyoka explains that she will use him in battle when needed, she instructs him to focus on housekeeping until then and when he finally sticks up for himself, Himari threatens to slice his head off. Kyoka acknowledges that the others might be uncomfortable with a male caretaker, but Yuki's really good at cleaning, and he is also vital to her ability. She asks that they all try to be nice to him and tells him not to worry since she will rip off his manhood if he does anything wrong. That night, Shushu who has shrunk to her tiny self, thinks she just caught Yuki spying on one of the girls, so she threatens to tell the commander. Shushu explains that her ability allows her to grow or shrink and she takes an incriminating picture. She was curious about Yuki so she has been keeping a close eye on him. Yuki tries to clear things up by explaining that he was just cleaning but she isn't interested in any of his excuses. Yuki assumes that she is trying to blackmail him for money but she just likes to keep things interesting. She wants him to be her slave but he tries to explain that he is already a slave. Shushu forces him to clean her room and his attempt at deleting the picture fails. She tells him to do her laundry as well but that just gives her another opportunity to take a misleading picture. While Yuki walks around depressed about being bullied, he finds Kyoka and Himari training outside. Just then, a Shuki appears and Kyoka uses the opportunity to show Himari how it's done. She absolutely destroys the low-budget anime monster, shocking Yuki and amazing Himari. Yuki can't believe how she instant killed it and he realizes that he can never get on her bad side. Nei arrives and reveals she will be living with Himari to a meeting, so he will be left with Shushu to protect the dorm. That night, 
Shu Shu forces him to give her a massage and reveal that she grew up without a father, she came to Mata looking for excitement even though it meant risking her life. The two decide to play some video games, but Yuki warns her that he's pretty good, they make a little bet which Yuki is hesitant to accept at first, but eventually decides that he will win and make her apologize for treating him so poorly. He actually loses every game though and ends up losing his shirt because of it, just then the two must rush outside as a giant Shuki has appeared to attack the barrier. Yuki thinks they should stay back but Shu Shu shows just how big she can get, Yuki does his best to keep up but these giants are quickly about to fight. Just a monster tries to battle it out with Shu Shu but she easily grabs it and smashes it straight into the ground, Yuki is then amazed when she easily overpowers it. Shu Shu sends it flying, only to punch it down and crush it beneath her feet, Shu Shu shrinks down a bit as being that size is completely exhausting. Just as she celebrates her victory another giant a monster attacks her, a bunch more Shuki merged with it to make it even bigger and Shu Shu quickly realizes that things could get bad if she doesn't end the fight now. She tries to use her ability to grow even more but it doesn't work for some reason, the monsters eventually grab her so she can't move and the giant lands a punch. Yuki is completely hopeless and can only watch as the giant monster takes the upper hand with another powerful punch, Yuki wishes he could transform in this moment but it's impossible without Kyoka. He wishes there was something he could do and he remembers that he transformed when his lips touched Kyoka's hand. This genius gets the bright idea to kiss something that she owns so he rushes to the laundry room, licking her glove fails but it did start the transformation so he is on the right track. Shoving his face in her shirt transforms his foot, but he needs something that will give a stronger reaction. He eventually finds her boots, but he really begins to question what this says about him as a person, things are getting really bad for Shushu outside so he rushes out there with Kyoka's boot. There is no time left so he must act now, if he really wants to be a hero even if it means looking a boot, Yuki sadly does just that and power erupts from his body. Back at the fight, Shu Shu realizes that she must have pushed herself too far by transforming into her jumbo size, the monster shows no signs of slowing down but Shu Shu realizes that her body will transform back to normal size soon. Just then, a partially transformed Yuki rushes towards her and is determined to try his best, despite not being at full power, Shu Shu keeps the thing from moving giving Yuki the perfect target. He unleashes a powerful kick, absolutely destroying this thing's head and winning the battle. Shu Shu thinks he was being too reckless by fighting at half power, but Yuki did it because she called them a wimp and told them to stay back before the fight. Afterwards, Kyoka works on fixing up Yuki's body, since there are some pretty painful repercussions for forcing a transformation on his body. The others mock him for being out of commission after just a couple minutes of combat but he points out that he just hasn't learned how to use his power yet. He wonders if they should be fixing the barrier but Kyoka reveals that barriers protecting important locations have special attributes, so long as the damage is minor it will repair itself. Yuki realizes that this explains what happened when the Shuki attacked earlier as well, Kyoka gets back to working on our boy's back but it's super painful and he wonders if this is his reward for protecting the dorm. Kyoka schooled Shu Shu for underestimating their opponent and instructs her to help Yuki with his chores as punishment. When they leave those Shu Shu reveals that she has even more incriminating photos, so she will continue being his master, Yuki realizes how bad things are getting for him and wonders if he will ever be free. Elsewhere, we see that a barrier gets shattered, another demon force arrives to find the cause and one of them tells the others to inform their commander, the remaining girl prepares to fight the thing but realizes that her opponent is no ordinary Shuki. The beast completely ignores her attack to grab the two that were running away, and reveals itself to knock the first girl back. This mega Shuki prepares to eat her but a mysterious person orders it to stop, as this mysterious lady master the Shuki, she explains that she can feel Yuki's presence somewhere in Mado and it's time to pay him a visit. The story continues, we see Kyoka get takes Yuki through a gateway and has some wait for her as she has important paperwork to take care of, Yuki can't believe how crazy interdimensional travel is since it only took a 50 minute drive on the other side to get here. Kyoka eventually returns, so she tells her boy to enjoy the fresh air while he can, since time off doesn't come very often, Yuki wonders where they're going, but he gets no answer from the very serious Kyoka. Back in Mato, Shushu looks for Yuki and Nei is told that the commander took him through the Yamagata passage, she is a bit surprised at first but remembers that today is a tragic day. 
Back with Yuki, Kyoka takes him to a cemetery, she explains that a while ago there was an incident where dozens of Shuki wandered into this world, and one of them was especially powerful. Kyoka remembers that day vividly, and she describes this powerful behemoth as having a single horn, this really stuck out to her as a child while this thing massacred to her hometown, so she called it the Unihorn. All the Shuki that crossed over that day were wiped out by the demon defense force who arrived to help. However, after looking through the records, Kyoka discovered that the Unihorn managed to escape, it was the only Shuki to do so and it used the gateway to return to Mado. This Unihorn is still alive and Kyoka gets furious as she explains that she has a score to settle against the powerful demon, she vows to wipe it from existence and Kyoka wants Yuki to make sure that he is prepared for when that day comes. This is the reason she brought him to the cemetery as she wanted to show him all the people she will avenge. Afterwards, the time to return to Mado has come but Yuki would like to take a little break, Yuki checks some Yelp reviews and learn that this cafe thereby is famous for its parfaits. Kyoka explains that returning to Mado is more important, but she is easily convinced by a picture of a great looking parfait. Kyoka is actually surprised by his assertiveness, but she is still more concerned with Mado. Yuki reveals that he lost his sister in a Mado mishap so he can understand how Kyoka feels. Yuki is quite the smart kid as he points out that she will miss her chance for revenge if she burns herself out. Kyoka realizes that he's interest assertive, he is also persuasive, Kyoka thinks to parfait tastes amazing and her smile brings Yuki some memories of his sister, they always got along really well and she would always encourage him to learn things like cooking and cleaning. Just then, Kyoka gets an emergency call from Mado, it's not life threatening but something serious is definitely happening. Break time is suddenly over and Kyoka has Yuki transform, his demon form gets them back quickly and Kyoko rewards him because that's just part of how her power works. At the meeting, Kyoka is informed that a discovery was made during patrols, a crater-like formation appeared nearby along with a large number of Shuki, Yuki takes one look at the iPad and is shocked to see hundreds of Shuki on a radar. Kyoka is even amazed as she has never seen anything like this before, Nei uses her ability to reveal that the Shuki are not leaving and seem to be making some kind of nest. Wiping all this Shuki out will be a huge undertaking for their squadron and Yuki is fired up. Kyoka declares that there will be taking three vehicles and Yuki is shocked to find that he is considered as one of these vehicles. Yuki takes off ahead of the others and they just call him a wild beast, Yuki and Kyoka arrive at the crater and he thinks about how horrible it would be if someone got stuck in there with all the Shuki, he wants to start taking them out but Kyoka tells them to wait for her signal. The others start attacking first and Kyoka explains that if the Shuki merge then it will be easier than taking them down one by one, just Shuki are tough but their fighting style is simple. As long as they stick to their strategy then will be impossible for them to lose, Kyoka tells Yuki to be ready since they will begin their attack once a giant Shuki reaches its big size. Just then a powerful beam comes out of nowhere and strikes Shushu, a look at where it came from reveals that it was a single horned beast, Kyoka instantly recognizes it as the one that massacred all those people and it attacks them. It absolutely destroys their truck and the girl mounted on it announces that she has joined the party, Himari is surprised that the girl can talk since she thought she was a monster but this just gets the girl upset. She fires a massive attack but Himari just manages to block it by transforming her arm into a shield. The attack proves to be too powerful though, as Himari's shield is destroyed and she gets hit by the devastating beam, Yuki and Kyoka quickly move in for an attack and they manage to push back the Unihorn. The girl is pleased with their power but Kyoka is furious to once again be face to face with the Unihorn. The girl is amused that they have a nickname for the demon and Yuki is stunned by how terrifying the beast looks, the one that destroyed Kyoka's hometown. Everyone on their team is in really bad shape and Kyoka demands to know who the girl is, this girl explains that she's the demon defense forces arch enemy and Kyoka shocked when she pulls out a Mato Peach. This girl wonders if Kyoka has seen her little brother anywhere but Kyoka doesn't answer, this girl uses the peach as a distraction to land a sneak attack but Yuki just manages to stop it. Our duo uses some kind of combo move but it does nothing to the girl. She explains that her younger brother always followed her around when they were younger, but the instant he got a little older he turned into a rascal. As this girl takes the upper hand in the fight, she explains that her brother getting older just meant that she could start to knock some manners into him. Yuki can't tell if this girl is a Shuki or not, but knows for sure that she is far different than any other opponent he has ever encountered. The girl prepares to say her little brother's name but she is interrupted by all the Shuki that have just finished combining into a huge giant, this girl could not be angrier about the interruption but this just reminds Yuki of his sister. The girl is furious to have been interrupted while talking about her brother and she instantly squashes the giant beast. 
She feeds the demon's remains to the Unihorn and Kyoka just now realizes that she must be the supreme commander of the Shuki. The girl is disappointed that they clearly don't know anything about the Mano and she easily dodges our hero's attack. She explains that this is a world full of curses and separates Kyoka from Yuki with an attack. The girl is impressed that Kyoka has such a powerful Shuki and takes hold of him. Yuki is terrified that she's going to crush him like she did to the giant, but the girl is stunned, she realizes that he isn't a Shuki at all, she reaches for him but Kyoka jumps back into the fight to push her back. Kyoka managed to do some damage and moves in for another attack, but the Unihorn stops her, they make their escape but Kyoka demands that the cowards come back. Kyoka has completely given into her rage since that they want to run from her, then she will just do exactly what the Unihorn did to all the fleeing villagers. She vows to tear them apart from behind but when she turns to look for Yuki, she sees that he is busy helping their team, Kyoka sucks up her pride and tells Yuki that Himari and Shushu safety is their top priority, so they will pull back for now. Kyoka regrets letting her rage take over, as she now realizes that it almost cost hurt her squad mates. When they return to the dorm, Kyoko explains that their team's wounds are light and they will be fully recovered by the next day, the little weirdo's reward this time is being stepped on and Yuki himself becomes terrified by the demands of his inner psyche. Yuki apologizes for letting the Unihorn get away but Kyoka doesn't blame him, as getting their team out safely was more important, she determines that the girl must be a new species of Shuki. She can't believe that one of them can understand their language now and is certain that this news will shock the world. Yuki then surprises her when he explains that he thinks the girl looks a lot like his sister, she also had a strange reaction when she saw his face, Kyoka doubts it since no human could be that strong. On top of that, no one has ever heard of a human becoming a Shuki, while cooking Yuki still wonders if it was his sister, the problem is he can't understand how she managed to survive or why she would be fighting against the demon defense force. He has no clue what to do if he sees her again, but he must snap back to reality to finish up his cooking, Nei has him kneel down to handle some business as his superior and she punches him right in the face for putting everyone in danger. With that out of the way, she understands that he fought hard to protect everyone and tells him that she will take care of dinner so he can rest up. He helps her cook anyway and decides that he will figure out what to do about the demon girl later, as he has work to do now. Elsewhere we learn that the girl's name is Aoba Wakura, she has made fun of her calling back with injuries, but their healer named Koko fixes her right up. Aoba is certain that the monster she fought with her brother Yuki but can only wonder how he ended up looking like a Shuki. She thought they did and the guys into the demon defense force but regardless of that, she enjoyed their little reunion. After a bath you keep accidentally walks in on Himari, so she prepares to end his life. However, just then a gateway surprisingly opens up and two girls appear. One is the commander of the 6th squad named Izumo and the other is her second in command named Izuma. They're very interested in Yuki, who's becoming quite popular but Izuma has them get Kyoka. The story continues, we see everyone meets Izumo, she compliments Kyoka in having a slave that can make a mean cup of coffee. The supreme commander has sent out a message regarding the appearance of the vicious humanoid Shuki, so Izumo has come to discuss it, all squadrons usually act independently but moving forward, the demon defense force will be more cohesive. Azuma is a real jerk as she mocks Himari for fainting during the battle against the humanoid, she calls her a coward and tells her that she is dragging her family's reputation through the mud, Azuma tells her to just give up on her dreams already and to come home with her. In reality though, Azuma points out that the humanoid Shuki is actually quite strong, Kyoka agrees and can understand what they have all been ordered to work together. Azuma expresses her confidence and teaming up with Kyoka but she doesn't have any trust in Kyoka's team, she rudely says that she won't name any names but there is someone that she is sure will slow them down. Kyoka gets an idea and points out that it's important for them to assess each other's strength, in order to do this, she recommends that they hold an inter-squad Mato exhibition match, everyone is shocked and Yuki's dumb brain immediately thinks of a sports match. Thankfully, Ne corrects him and informs him that it's actually a contest of strength and skill between squadrons, Kyoka would like for it to be single combat so Izumo agrees. Izumo will have to make preparations first so they leave. Just then, Himari asks Kyoka help her prepare for the match, Kyoka explains that it won't be easy but Imari proclaims that as long as it means she will win, she will do whatever it takes, Kyoka agrees and tells her to start training right away. Himari then turns to Yuki and reveals that what their agreement really meant was that Yuki would be her slave now. After the girls enjoy Yuki's cooking, he reveals that his secret ingredient was chicken fat, Himari calls him a great slave so he wonders how that ended up happening in the first place. 
The answer is simple, it's for the sake of the Mato exhibition and Himari declares that she has to win, Kyoka knew that Azuma's attitude struck a nerve, so this match gives Himari the opportunity to teach her a lesson. As they travel for training, Yuki still can't figure out how he ended up being Himari's slave, Himari reveals that transforming parts of her body into weapons isn't actually her main ability. She shows her real power by showing Yuki her phone but it just looks like some kind of trading card game, Himari explains that her ability is called learning. This means she can learn other people's abilities and use them herself. Yuki points out how overpowered that is and Himari goes on to say that all she has to do is select the person's ability on her phone and implement it. She has the commander selected now so she can use Kyoka's ability, Yuki wonders if Amari knows all the details of Kyoka's ability but all she knows is that it's physically demanding. Himari thinks it just means that she will have to take over the cleaning and laundry and proclaims that she doesn't mind doing that stuff as long as she beats her sister. Just then they are surrounded by Shuki, so Himari has Yuki's transform, Yuki points out that he warned her already, so he transforms but the process this time is a bit different. This time he is a different shape compared to when the commander does it and demon Yuki is much faster, he thinks about how he can move with lightning speed in this form and he is even faster than Kyoka. The main drawback is that he clearly isn't as strong but he decides to just work with what he has, Yuki uses his immense speed and unleashes an insane barrage of punches, Himari is of course amazed and becomes confident that Yuki can help her beat her sister. After Yuki finishes up destroying the Shuki, he wonders why Himari chose this ability over any other ones that she could choose. Himari explains that it's because this gives Yuki a chance to be useful, she begins to tell him that he should be grateful but she stops when she finds out the price for using Kyoka's ability. After Yuki is rewarded for his work, he explains that Himari would be better off using a different ability, Himari says that she would if she could, but there is a compatibility component to her learning power, it degrades the quality of most abilities so the point that they become useless. For example, if she were to use Shushu's growing abilities, then only her nose would grow by an inch. Yuki reminds her of the price for using Kyoka's abilities, but Himari just accepts it. Yuki wants to know why she is so desperate to beat her sister, so she gives him a little history lesson. She was born into a very influential family with major accomplishments in Mado. All her older sisters were successful so everyone had high hopes for Himari. However, she would often overexert herself before the big event and get hurt or she would get nervous and come down with a fever, she has never had any results to show for it and Yuki thinks about how he can relate. The weakness in her power was also well known, so she would always get teased when she couldn't keep up with her sisters, this is her first chance since she cut ties with her family to prove them wrong about her. Himari demands a Yuki cooperate, and he thinks about how hard it is to help someone that can even ask politely. Himari then reveals that her ultimate goal is to become a hero just like their commander, she hopes that she will become a new version of herself if she can beat Azuma, Himari wants a different side of her to shine and Yuki can relate to that as well. Himari points out that there is only one thing missing for the fight, and that is a finishing move to demolish their enemy. Now that Yuki actually uses his brain to think about it, he realizes that all he has been doing so far is mindlessly punching and kicking everything inside like a maniac. He has his own reasons for wanting to become stronger, and he begins to wonder if Himari is the key to opening a new path, Yuki is convinced and agrees to help her. Himari reminds him that he is her slave and explains that her sister's power is called Golden Hour, she can control time, including freezing it and rewinding it. After hearing this, the once very confident and optimistic Yuki realizes that they are screwed. At the other squadron's dorm, Azuma consents that her sister is talking about her. She vows that she will put Himari in her place at the Mato exhibition and can't wait be more excited for that day. During practice, Himari reveals that while Azuma's power is undoubtedly dangerous, it consumes power, she will get tired if she uses it too many times and that is how they will win. Yuki points out that just the fact that Azuma can use her ability more than once is a huge problem but there is more, Himari explains that Azuma strikes a weird pose that trigger her ability, as it's a routine that supposedly enhances her skills. Because of this, Yuki recommends that the use is blistering speed for their finishing move, Himari agrees and plans to use an ultra-fast maneuver that won't even give Azuma time to freeze or rewind time. It will also have to have enough force to knock Azuma out of the fight completely, Yuki tries out a swift step forward into a head punch, but it needs to be polished into a deadly blow that can't be dodged. Himari has Yuki channel all his strength into a single part of his body so he does it to his legs and they get huge, just then Shuki's appear just in time to serve as practice dummies. 
Yuki's giant legs make him even faster than before but his first attempt at a special move doesn't go so well. After defeating all the Shuki again, Yuki realizes that he overdid it as his legs are exhausted, it's clear that he lost all his arm strength since he poured all his energy into his legs. Himari determines that he just needs to keep experimenting with it until he perfects his technique and rewards him, this time with a nice little pet on his head. Kyoka arrives at their next training session and she's amazed to see that Yuki really does look different. She also compliments Himari for thinking about a good finishing move but wonders why she is watching him from so far away. Kyoka reminds her that there is a fundamental essence to using her ability and tells her to make her proud as she leaves, her words make their way through Himari's mind, so she mounts Yuki and explains that she will be riding him during the exhibition match. Himari thinks about how Kyoka's ability requires that she control her slave, not just sitting back and coaching him, Himari grabs a hold of his chains and orders him to channel his strength into his legs. Yugi does and strangely notices that he feels more power flowing through him than before, Himari orders him to curse the first Shuki they see and his attack destroys it easily. Yuki can't even believe what he just did and they realize that it's a foolproof finishing move that they were working towards, Yuki isn't sure if he can replicate it but luckily for them there are plenty of practice dummies appearing to help out. After defeating them all, Yuki is a million times more worn out than usual, Yuki receives his next reward and vows to master this new technique so he can put it to use again in the future. A sweet training montage begins and it shows how Yuki gets more and more powerful. On the day of the exhibition match, Izumo and the others arrive. Azuma can tell that Himari has something planned but she tries to put out in her mind, as she doesn't think her sister will be able to pull it off. Himari gets a bit flustered but Yuki arrives to tell them that the match will begin soon, Yuki can tell that Himari is bothered so he tells her not to worry and reminds her that they train their butts off, Himari's confidence is restored and she guarantees that they will win. When everyone's ready, they all write their names down so a girl named Jinna can use her ability, it allows her to create a barrier by drawing a line on the ground acts as a boundary, only those who sign their names can enter. Furthermore, any damage sustained during combat inside the barrier will be healed. Jinna will serve as the referee and she is just glad that she can witness the demon defense force in action, not everyone believes that Peach's grant power is based on a person's nature and knowledge but she does. Because of this, she is excited to see everyone's powers, Jinna's barrier can withstand the power of 1000 Shuki and they're also counting on her to judge the fight. Yuki can obviously tell that Jinna is a demon defense force fangirl but this also means that she hates men, Nei counts as a non-fighter so her job is to cheer on her teammates. Right off the bat, round 1 will be between Himari and Azuma, the rules are whoever gives up or gets knocked out first loses. Injuries will be healed so they are encouraged to go all out, Azuma plans to drag Himari back home when she beats her but Himari explains that she isn't the same person she was back then. She declares that she will win and has Yuki transform, Azuma won't deny a dog handler to use her dog in battle so she allows Yuki to take part in the fight. With both sides ready the match begins, Azuma starts by warning her sister but before she can even finish her sentence, she is gasping for air from Yuki's lightning fast attack. She has no clue where it came from but gathers herself to rewind time by 5 seconds, time rewinds to the very start of the match but Imari can tell that Azuma is getting tired. Luckily for them, they plan ahead in case it couldn't finish her with a single blow. Azuma prepares to find out if their first attack was a fluke, and thinks about how Himari doesn't seem to have realized that her time manipulation ability has gotten stronger, Azuma will point out that little sisters can never be big sisters and uses her ability called prime time. The story continues, we see Himari doesn't give her sister any time, and has Yuki used an insanely fast attack. Azuma manages to use Golden Hour to rewind time back 5 seconds to just before the attack, just as they enter Azuma's attack range, she then freezes time for 5 seconds. Unfortunately for her, she notices that they got out of her range and Azuma stunned to realize that they are switching tactics on purpose. Himari glad to see that they made her sister waste her ability, so she tells Yuki to stick to the plan, spectators are amazed to see Yuki moving faster than a speeding bullet, and it becomes clear that Himari is trying to confuse Azuma as they're just running in circles. Yuki can feel in his bones how desperately Himari wants to win and reiterates how he must help her defeat Azuma, Yuki turns up the speed and their little cheering section cheers them on. Azuma pulls out a gun specifically modified for use in Moto, but our boy Yuki is just way too fast in this form. Azuma is becoming more and more annoyed, but Yuki's pleased that they're throwing her off balance just like they planned. Azuma watches and is amused that this fight is actually turning out to be a good one. 
Everyone thought that Yuki's servitude was reserved for just Kyoka, but it's clear now that he's able to devote himself to a new master. As the two fight, Himari is amazed to see that Yuki is fighting so hard for her, he is trying much harder than she expected, so she determines that she must apologize for giving him such a hard time before. However, first they must win the fight, Himari reminds herself that Azuma can use Golden Hour instantly. However, she has to strike her weird pose first, the second they see her starting the pose, they decide to either attack or retreat. Beyond that, they can tell whether or not she already used her ability based on her behavior. If she seems tired all of a sudden, it's proof that she just rewound time. If not, then they need to avoid her. As they dodge bullets, Himari determines that Azuma can only use her ability a few more times at best, since it's a huge drain on her energy. If they can just make her waste it, then they will surely win. Azuma already knows exactly what Himari is thinking and figured out her strategy. This being the case she decides to finally use her trump card, Himari assumes that it's another golden hour and they are out of its range. She is wrong however, as Azuma uses prime time to freeze time for 10 seconds, this freezes a much larger area capturing everyone, and Amari has no way to escape now. The evil Azuma vows to defeat her sister, so she can bring her back home and make her life a living hell. She fires several bullets at her sister just before the 10 seconds ends. Once the time is up, everything begins to move again and the bullets strike our heroes. No one even saw what happened as they all thought Himari was winning the fight, but she is now down for the count. Azuma then explains her prime time ability by striking the ultimate pose, she's able to double the amount of time she can control, the only downside was that it took a few seconds longer than golden hour to activate. Azuma knew that her sister was getting a hang of her other pose, so she didn't have any other choice, everyone watching stunned since they didn't know that Azuma could freeze time for an entire 10 seconds. Himari can't believe that her sister had hidden this ability, but Azuma explains that a genius like her only gets more brilliant over time, not including that in her calculations with Himari's downfall. Our announcer points out that Himari was able to take the upper hand due to Yuki's speed, but Azuma ruined all of that with her trump card. Unleashing her primetime ability is what completely turned the tables, Nei fears for her friend but Shushu knows that the fight isn't over yet. They cheer their friend on and encourage Himari to show everyone what their squadron is made of, things aren't going so well though and Azuma knows Himari's learning ability too well. Azuma explains that when Himari's learning power adapts an ability that comes with a cost attached, she can't execute a skill switch until the price is paid, that is why Himari can't just change abilities mid-match. Azuma really likes to kick her opponents while they are down, as she reminds Himari of the past, she reminds her sister that she was never able to meet expectations when it came to important things. This time is no different, as Himari has no way to counter Azuma's prime time ability, she demands a Himari give up and Himari begins to wonder if things will just go the way they always do. Himari wonders if all her effort was in vain but Yuki points out that Azuma is just trying to get in their heads, he tells Himari to look at Azuma's face and points out how exhausted she is. Azuma is clearly upset and Yuki predicts that she won't even be able to use her ability again, Yuki declares that he would be ashamed if his master did something as stupid as quitting while they are so close to victory. Himari tells them that he looks pretty exhausted himself and he has a real smart mouth for a slave, Himari's confidence has been restored and she promises to punish Yuki after this is all over. Himari's friends cheer her on as they have finally gotten back up and it's clear that the fight's climax is finally approaching. Azuma prepares her weapon and tells Himari to stop with her shameful behavior, there is no messing with Himari's mind anymore, as you can see things clearly now. She points out that in their squadron, staying strong and fighting to the end isn't shameful behavior at all. Azuma thinks about how she thought that breaking Himari's spirit now would make it easier to train her later on, but things have not gone that way. Yuki and Himari prepare to use a move that they practiced, so Azuma strikes her golden hour pose. Yuki's body emits a blinding light but Azuma shocks since she already struck her pose, she rewinds time 5 seconds anyway, prepared to end the fight but she is even more stunned to see plain old Yuki in front of her. She can't see Himari anywhere but time is running out on her ability, so she fired several bullets at him, everyone is then stunned when Azuma takes damage and they see that Himari was on the ground. Azuma didn't think that Himari was so desperate to win that she would sacrifice everything and she collapses, everyone is at a complete loss for words, but Himari strikes a victory pose. Himari is officially announced the winner and everyone celebrates, Kyoka explains that Himari used the flash and smoke from Yuki's reverse transformation to blind Azuma. She is amazed by her second-in-command and compliments her on her strategy. 
Everyone stops cheering when they realize that Yuki is in bad shape, but Kyoka tells them that there is no need to worry. Yuki regains consciousness that they're getting shot and is told that usually these kind of injuries would be life-threatening. However, since he sustained them inside Jinna's barrier, they will heal up as good as new, Yuki is healed almost instantly and he is amazed by Jinna's power. Himari shoves him off for now that he is okay, but he reminds her that he just regained consciousness, the two smiles though as they realize that they really just pulled off that difficult victory. Himari acknowledges that he worked really hard and she hopes her boy up, Azuma regains consciousness as well and thinks about how Himari used to be. She remembers how her sister caught a nasty cold right before entrance exams because she worked herself to the bone, Azuma considered Himari an overachiever and thought she was naive. However, now she realizes that she was wrong, Azuma confronts Himari and our boy Yuki has no clue what to do. Azuma surprisingly admits that Himari has gotten stronger and promises to treat her better. She wants Himari to return home but Azuma declines, as the Seventh Squadron is where she belongs now, there is nothing that can be said to bring her back, so Azuma is crushed. Afterwards, the two fighters recover from battle and Himari rewards Yuki with a kiss. Elsewhere, Izumo goes over the fight with Izuma, Izumo explains that this was Yuki's first fight against a human, so it's likely that he subconsciously held back his attacks. This being the case, Yuki's first direct hit would have normally killed Azuma instantly. Izumo reminds Azuma to never underestimate her opponent, since she didn't finish them off after using prime time. Izumo's final comment is about Yuki, she is amazed by how he just kept on pushing himself over and over, only to sacrifice himself in the end. Outside we learn that it's Shushu turn to fight next, but Imari and Yuki haven't returned yet, Shushu was eager to impress Yuki with her skills as well, so she goes to get them. Inside the dorm, Himari tells Yuki that he's the main reason she was able to defeat her sister and gives him another kiss. Himari apologizes for being so mean to him and miss that boys might not be so bad. Himari points out that the kisses are nothing more than just the price of using the ability and Shushu shocked to hear this for the first time. Outside Azuma apologizes for losing her match. Her failure means that it's up to Sahara to win for them now, but Sahara couldn't be more calm. Sahara is confident she will win but we see that there are also some uninvited guests nearby. The story continues, we see round 2 Shushu vs Sahara and they both specialize in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Shushu wants to impress Yuki with her skills and hopes that he can give her some praise afterwards. For losing Azuma's test with being a cheerleader and Sahara promises to make her friends proud, the two fighters decide to hold off on using their abilities, so their battle begins with some serious hand-to-hand -hand combat. Shushu instantly slams Sahara to the ground, but Sahara manages to eventually suplex her right back. Shushu was just getting started, but Sahara is already exhausted and declares that it's time for them to start using their abilities. Sahara's friends wonder how many she will be using of something and they predict that she will use three. Kyoka thinks about how both of their abilities center around physical attacks, and Izumo predicts that Sahara will end the match shortly. Shushu turns into a giant and Sahara uses her ability called Mad Sheep, she then says the word 3 before dodging an attack and she declares that paper beats rock, while smacking Shushu right cross big giant person face. Sahara's Mad Sheep ability allows her to boost her strength for the precise amount of time she specifies in advance. This has a 1 minute minimum and a 60 minute maximum, the shorter amount of time she says, the stronger she gets. However, her ability has a mandatory 3 minute cooldown period, the power of Blondie lands some attacks and she points out that Shushu's large size makes her an easy target. Sahara lands a devastating blow and Shushu worries about disappointing Yuki, Sahara wants her to give up but Shushu explains that she's just warming up. Sahara admires that attitude and Shushu can't even really explain why she feels so determined. A look into the past shows that Shushu was never interested in romance with some dude, she always hoped for something more interesting and decided that she would never be bored if she joined the Demon Defense Force in Moto. Her friends told her that she would understand the value of a relationship one day, and she now wants Yuki to watch her as she does some serious damage to Sahara. Sahara tries to suggest that Shushu shrink down for better mobility, but that sounds like a snooze fest to the thrill-seeking Shushu. Shushu likes to go big or go home, so she does the opposite of Sahara's suggestion and grows even more. No one saw this turn of events coming and Shushu slams her gigantic body onto Sahara. Sahara is not to be underestimated though, as she is holding her own. Shushu grabs her and points out how she was just too big to dodge this time. Shushu ruthlessly smashes her into the ground and they celebrates that she won the match. 
Jinnah begins a down count, but everyone is shocked to see that Sahara is not only still in the fight, she's also now powering up. Azuma explains that if Sahara loses consciousness while her ability is still active, her heightened killer instincts take control of her body. She will attack enemies and allies alike, but it's the cause of such immense power, she is able to sleep anytime anywhere, and this is her hidden power. The unconscious Sahara then absolutely destroys Shushu and the down count now begins for her. Unfortunately, Shushu can't recover from the powerful attack and Sahara is announced as the winner, Jinnah patches her all up and Shushu apologizes for losing. Kyoko makes her feel better by saying they can work on improving later, and Shushu leaves to change clothes. As she leaves, she begins to cry though since she looked like a fool in front of Yuki, Yuki overheard her and goes to try to offer her a drink since he is the caretaker of the dorm. Shu Shu would rather he erase her memory of the pitiful loss be healed, unfortunately doesn't have that kind of power. He acknowledges that it must be tough to lose, but he didn't think the fight was pitiful. Yuki actually wishes he could have seen more of her awesome wrestling moves and this makes Shu Shu feel a lot better, Shu Shu has him close his eyes and surprises Yuki with a kiss. Yuki has no clue why she would do that so she explains that she just wanted to follow the shock of losing with an even bigger shock. However, she thinks about how she can't tell him how she really feels until she gets him to like her more. Outside, Nei informs Kyoka that she doesn't sense any anomalies nearby, that changes very quickly though, as she is stunned to find someone that looks right at her. This mysterious chick is somehow able to speak to Nei and tells her to say hello to the others for her. She has a less friendly message as well though, and it's that a real battle will begin now. Before Nei can even explain anything, a bunch of Shuki emerge from the ground. Jinnah assures everyone that her barrier is impenetrable but everyone is shocked when another mysterious person arrives, his name is Ryron and he is some type of humanoid. Ryron unleashes a powerful attack and shocks everyone when it starts breaking Jinnah's barrier. The exhibition match is called off immediately and Kyoka has Izumo take the non-combatants back to the dorm. Ryron is eager to eliminate them all. So Kyoka has all fighters prepared for battle, she instructs everyone to destroy all the hollows from Bleach and starts off by sending one of the big ones back to Hueco Mundo. Shushu and Yuki return outside and Shushu wastes no time in jumping into battle, she already feels way better but Sahara must jump in to protect her, and the two decide to work together. Ryron realizes that they aren't his target, and Himari isn't either, he finds Himari quite annoying however, so he uses a powerful attack on her. Azuma just manages to rescue her and the two sisters realize that Ryron is going to be a dangerous opponent, they signal to each other as they have thought of a plan and Himari takes off running. Ryron commends Azuma for saving Himari but Azuma vows to make him pay for trying to hurt her sister. Himari finds Kyoko and Yuki and surprisingly asks to mount Yuki with her, Yuki has never had two people mount him before but they all decide to give it a try. Yuki kisses Himari's hand and Kyoko predicts that with two masters, Yuki will take on a more powerful form, Yuki then bursts with power and begins a whole new transformation. Yuki is a whole other demon now, and he can feel the power of coursing through his body. It's time to show what his new form can do, and Yuki is certain that he can replicate the move Aoba used on them, Yuki channels his energy and unleashes an insanely powerful blast. Their girls can't believe what the power of having two masters can do, but they are confident that they can beat the entire swarm of Shuki now. Himari is worried about her sister but Kyoka confidently tells her that she will be okay, since they have Azumo. Nearby Nei informs Izumo that there are two more humanoids, Izumo returns to the battlefield and refuses to be outshined by the 7th squadron. Jinna complains about not being able to see the fight but it can't be helped as the dorm has the strongest barrier, this is like torture for her but Nei lets her link up to her mind so she can watch. The fight shows Kyoka destroying some demons and Jinna cheers everyone on. Shuki cannot be beaten with normal weapons, the only way to counter them is with the abilities granted by the Peaches, and by using weapons that are specially made to be imbued with the Peaches' power. The only exception to this is Kyoka, she trained atop a sacred mountain to perfect her own unique style of combat that destroys creatures. Through her training, she gained the skills necessary to defeat Shuki without relying on her Peach ability, this is why she was able to become a commander and she is at her strongest right now. Nearby, Azuma is using her time manipulation ability, but only to evade Raren's attacks. Azuma is done to see the immense power that these humanoids are capable of and she eventually falls victim to one of his attacks. Ryren points out that Azuma can't do her time manipulation pose without her arm, but he is wrong as Azuma can pose no matter what the situation is. 
Azuma rewinds time 5 seconds to when she still had both arms and dodges the attack this time, she is still in pretty bad shape though and Ryren prepares a terrifying attack to finish her off. The moment intensifies as Azuma prepares to be killed, but all the tension breaks as Azumo appears out of nowhere, everyone involved this stunt to Sierra appear out of thin air and she tells Azuma that she will take it from here. Ryren doesn't like how casual Azumo was being and reminds her that his entire army is closing in on her. Izumo finds this statement humorous as the dust clears and she reveals that she has already neutralized any Shuki that might try to interfere with their fight. Ryren is stunned to see that he is now surrounded by his destroyed army and Izumo points out others should still be two officer level humanoids somewhere. However, she decides to leave that for later as she would just take care of Ryren right now. Ryren acknowledges Izumo's power but still has confidence as he looks forward to a fun fight. The story continues. We see the fight rages on but there seems to be an endless number of Shuki, Kyoka shows her might as commander though and takes the lead. Shushu and Sahara handles some Shuki as well and Azuma watches Azumo prepare to fight Ryren. Ryren is disappointed to have only encountered two opponents, which makes it clear that he is targeting commanders only. Ryren declares that he will end the fight in the blink of an eye and unleashes a powerful lightning attack. The huge beam does massive damage and he is once again disappointed to see how easy it was to defeat one of their leaders. He is of course then shocked when Azumo appears behind him to kick him right in the head. This guy actually managed to dodge the attack and he reveals that her efforts are useless, even if she were able to land an attack, his skin is as hard as steel and he wouldn't feel a single thing. He declares that he is invincible but Azumo dodges attacks using some kind of portal, she then uses one of these portals to attack and Ryren is stunned to see that she somehow managed to cause damage to his arm. Jinna admires her leader's abilities and points out how both commanders were able to come up with a plan to wipe out an invading army instantly. Ryren has had enough of this boring fight and begins to power up as he has finally decided to get serious, he sends his power into the sky and uses an attack he is sure she won't be able to avoid. Yuki fears that she has been eliminated, but Kyoka knows better and tells him to just watch. Ryren triumphantly declares his victory, but he's being short-sighted as Izumo surprisingly still alive, she uses a portal to land a punch and Ryren gets completely confused when she also seems to have teleported him with just one touch. Ryren is now hopelessly falling through the air and Jinna celebrates her leader's god-like ability, Izumo is able to manipulate the space around her and it's called Ain no Matori. Izumo uses her ability to open another portal and makes Ryren disappear, Izumo declares that his impenetrable defense doesn't matter one bit when she can rip apart the fabric of space. Yuki is knob how the two leaders completely wiped out an army and Himari points out that this is how all commanders are, they are in a whole another level. On top of that, Kyoko wants to be in charge of all the commanders, so her goal seems impossible. Yuki's doubts are put to rest though and Kyoka confidently declares that she will become supreme commander no matter what. Kyoka tells the other girls to handle any remaining Shuki and Yuki realizes that he can't just stand around admiring Kyoka's strength, he reminds himself that he came to Mato to be a hero and declares that he will join them. Afterwards, the group discussed how they were able to win the battle, their problem is that, according to Ney's report, there were other enemy generals somewhere nearby. Our group diligently looked for them, but they couldn't find a single trace of these other generals. Ney apologizes for detecting them too late, but they just assumed that these generals had some kind of cloaking ability. They tell Ney not to dwell on it, since her warning kept them from getting blindsided by their attackers. Izumo calls Yuki a little slave and tells him that he stole the show on the battlefield, he has won over Jinna as well, since she now realizes that boys can sometimes be talented too, she is his biggest fan now and even wants an autograph. Himari then approaches her sister and thanks her for coming to her rescue, Azuma keeps her cool and simply explains that letting the enemy defeat Himari would bring shame to their family. Azuma keeps putting on her act as she states that this was her only reason for saving her, she offers to train him area up if she comes back home with her but Imari reminds her that the 7th squadron is her home. The two commanders decide to call the metric draw but they are disappointed since they were looking forward to their one-on-one -on -one fight, the two squadrons part ways but Azuma leaves with a mysterious smile. It's time to relax but Yuki did eliminate a lot of Shuki, so he is rewarded for his efforts. Later that night, Ney makes a drawing of what the hidden enemy generals look like, the drawing is quite impressive and it helps them realize that these generals are not the humanoids they encountered last time. Yuki thinks back to the opponent they are talking about and he can't help but think about how she looks like his sister, he wonders if she belongs to another group or perhaps there's some other reason that she wasn't with these enemies. 
Our protagonist finally gets some much needed sleep but we see that Izumo uses her portals for things other than fighting as she appears to watch Yuki. The next day, Yuki, Kyoko, and Himari go to visit the Six Squadron's dorm, Izumo greets them as the two commanders have important matters to discuss. Kyoka tells Himari to get acquainted with the members of the other squadron and Izumo encourages her to really look around. As for our protagonist, Yuki is confident in his role as the squad's caretaker and knows that his job is to help out any way he can, this works out perfectly since some of us who most troops are out right now, including their own caretaker. Yuki declares that he has their back and vows to do his best, our protagonist Yuki seems excited as he gets to do what he enjoys and he starts off by cleaning. Unfortunately, there isn't much to do as the entire dorm is pretty clean already, he is disappointed after getting himself all hyped up but he luckily finds one stain, he does some deep analysis on it and determines that he has the perfect cleaner to get the job done. Next up is laundry but he has to calm himself down as he still hasn't gotten used to doing it. Back home, Shushu wonders what Yuki is doing but reminds herself that she would wait to tell Yuki her feelings until he likes her more, she decides to use this time to improve herself and settles on doing that by cleaning up. Back at the other dorm, Yuki prepares to deliver Azuma her clean uniform but he fears what she might say when she sees him, he's relieved to see that she doesn't seem to be there and decides to just leave the uniform in her room. This ends up being a regrettable decision though, since things get a bit weird when he opens a door to find that Azuma has pictures of Himari everywhere. Azuma's true love of her sister is evident, but it's a bit too much, so our protagonist Yuki gets out of there as fast as he can. Yuki then finds Sahara fast asleep but somehow ends up in a strange spot, Sahara apologizes afterwards and they find it very still Himari, they wonder what's wrong with her, so she explains that she's just waiting to speak to her sister. Azuma's busy getting shredded by lifting some heavy weights and Himari wonders if she does this all the time, she does and Sahara reveals that Azuma trained like this well before the exhibition match was even a thought. Himari is amazed that her sister is pushing herself even harder than she used to and Sahara wonders if Himari looks up to her big sister. Himari points out that her personality sucks but concedes that Azuma does well academically and athletically, Himari has always thought that she could learn a thing or two from her big sis. Sahara explains that she's a big believer in the theory that someone's peach ability is based on their knowledge and nature. In Himari's case, her desire to learn from Azuma is perhaps what gave her the ability to learn and use other people's powers, as for Azuma, her ability to control time might come from her desire to spend time with her little sister. It makes a lot more sense than Himari is willing to admit and Sahara encourages Himari to talk to her sister more often, Yuki agrees so Himari goes to see her. Azuma keeps up her tough act but it's clear that they're getting along better than before, Sahara thinks that showing Himari Azuma's room would be the quickest way to fix the relationship but Yuki thinks it would be best to keep that room a secret. Nearby Kyoka explains that they should proactively search out the humanoids, they haven't been making any moves recently, so Kyoka thinks the investigation should start near the crater where they first appeared. Kyoka points out that Azumo eliminated one of the four confirmed humanoids but Azumo actually isn't so sure about that. Elsewhere, we find that Ryren is actually still alive, he has fully recovered and his humanoid bodies named Shikoku point out how close he was to dying. We then see what happened just before Ryren was sucked up until the portal in time Shikoku rescued him. The delusional Ryren is certain that he could have kept fighting after that, but the Shikoku points out that the battle was lost when he allowed them to destroy his army, Shikoku does a little review of the events. First, she fought the third squadron to evaluate their enemy's capabilities, it was a piece of cake for her, but the third squadron leader wasn't with them. That is why the goal of their most recent attack was to experience the power of a commander, these commanders blew her expectations out of the water. Ryron wanted to launch a full-scale attack on the demon defense force but the commanders proved that they can't do it. Ryron still thinks they can win but the other humanoid named Juryu agrees with the Shikoku. With that settled, it's time that they go with Shikoku's plan, hers is simply to attack when they have gathered all eight of their people and operate in the shadows until then. Ryren hates being called people but Shikoku can't help but be interested in them. Humans are incredibly entertaining to her, and they are far more complex than she ever could have imagined. Kyoka's meeting with the Azumo comes to an end but Azumo has one more thing on her mind, it's in regards to personnel and Azumo shocks Kyoka when she asks to have the little slave. The story continues, we see Kyoka is stunned to hear that Izumo wants Yuki and she explains that it's because her personal life is a bit dull. That is why she wants a pet who can help her relax after a hard day's work. 
Kyoka clearly doesn't want to do it, but it's almost tries to make her an offer she can't refuse. If she hands the little slave over Azumo endorse her and the next Supreme Commander election, this is a really big deal, but Kyoka still refuses. She declares that she will become Supreme Commander on her own, not by leveraging one of her subordinates. Their meeting is over, but isn't would like to know if she can date Yuki in her free time. Afterwards, Kyoka tells Yuki everything, Yuki tells he is busy being the 7th Squadron's caretaker but Kyoka concedes that she can't control what he does in his free time. Yuki thinks about all his tasks and just now realizes that he doesn't actually have much free time. That night, Yuki goes to rest and thinks about how he's supposed to become a hero not a pet, just then Izumo comes to see him and tells him to keep quiet. She admits to having a crush on him and would like Yuki to be her boyfriend. Yuki is stunned since he thought she just wanted him as a pet but she actually wants a real relationship with him. Izumo was won over by his bravery and his housekeeping skills. Izumo shows what she can do with her ability but Yuki tells her that he needs time to decide if he wants a relationship or not. Just then Shushu barges in, wanting to play video games with Yuki, but she is stunned by what she sees. The girls all meet up and scold Azumo for sneaking into the dorm, Kyoka agreed not to interfere with their lives but Azumo abusing her power to pounce on Yuki is not okay. Their meeting is over, so Azumo says goodbye to Yuki and heads home. Yuki is exhausted, so he's told to get some rest as they will be having early morning training the next day. The next morning, Kyoka reveals that they will surely have to fight the humanoids again. In preparation for this, she would like to try practicing how to lend out her slave ability. It would allow the others to ride Yuki in slave form, it has become pretty clear that Yuki's attributes change based on who's riding him. The more transformations he's able to achieve, the more weapons they will have available to them. Nei is first up, so she gets on his back and takes a hold of his chains, Nei gives the chains a good pull and Yuki begins to transform. He achieves a completely new form, but he can't really describe anything about it right now. Yuki makes sure that it's okay if he gives it a test, so Nei prepares herself by holding on tight. Yuki does some shadow boxing and can instantly tell that he doesn't feel as strong as the other transformations, he also doesn't move as fast as his whirlwind transformation. However, his senses feel sharper than ever, his eyesight and his hearing are also enhanced. Yuki tries channeling his energy into his eyes and shockingly finds that he has x-ray vision. He apologizes for seeing things he shouldn't be seeing, so they all realize what's going on. Kyoka is amazed with his power and realizes that this ability can be used to sniff out hidden Shuki. However, it comes at a great cost, unlike when Himari uses her learning ability to borrow Yuki, lending him out directly takes a considerable amount of strength. Yuki transforms back to normal and Nei thanks him and gives him a peck on the cheek as a reward, Nei apologizes for being so forward but this helps Kyoka realize something. The one responsible for giving Yuki his reward is the borrower, not the lender. Kyoko apologizes to Nei since she assumed she would be responsible for rewarding him when lending her ability. Shushu gets an idea and eagerly declares that it's her turn to transform Yuki. Kyoko warns Shushu to be sure about her decision since she might have to one day use it in battle, if the fighting ever gets intense, then her reward might end up being more extreme than Nei's was. Shushu actually likes this idea, but she hides it by declaring that defeating Shuki is their number one priority, Shushu hops on his back and takes a hold of his chains. Yuki transforms once again and he can instantly tell that this transformation is much stronger than the others. However, he is much bulkier and much more sluggish, Kyoka agrees that he's definitely powerful but she doesn't think it's worth lending her ability for such a simple upgrade. Shushu doesn't want her to rush to conclusions and points out that there's a good chance that if she goes into giant mode, Yuki will grow with her. Shushu gives it a try but she ends up crushing the normal size Yuki when he isn't able to grow with her. Shushu gets even more disappointed though when her reward just ends up being that she has to bandage him up. That transformation was pretty underwhelming, so Kyoka could decide that they won't be using it in battle anytime soon. Yuki is worried about Kyoka using too much power but she says that she will just have to get used to it. Yuki's transformation with Nei as his master seems like it could be useful, so they will focus on developing that more. Nei heads off to get ready for school and Yuki wonders what her reason is for joining the Demon Defense Force, Nei is ready for school so Yuki offers to walk her there. Nei allows it, since Nei is his superior and she would like for him to get to know her better. The two of them go through a portal and Nei is surprised to hear that Yuki wants to know why she joined. Going to school while being in the Demon Defense Force has a lot of responsibility but Nei thinks it's worth it, she reveals that it gives her the best chance to find her parents. 
Nay explains that one day her parents just disappeared and all signs pointed to it being a mountain mishap. There are rumors of people receiving phone calls or catching glimpses of people that disappeared during mountain mishaps. Yuki has heard of these rumors and now understands that she joined the force in the hopes of finding her parents. Nay believes that her feelings manifested as her ability after eating a peach, since it's able to help her find things. Yuki assures her that her parents are alive somewhere, just like his sister is. Back in Mato, Izumo reveal a message she received from the Supreme Commander, even if they find the humanoid Shuki, they are not too engaged with them until the Supreme Commander gives the order. It's pretty obvious that she wants to speak with them and perhaps assess how intelligent they are. If it goes well, they might be able to solve the Shuki problem and prevent Madame mishaps. Kyoka is against the whole idea and points out that these humanoids are the type to attack first and ask questions later, she doubts that humanoids will just want to talk to them and she thinks the commander is just being naive. Izumo concedes that it would probably just evolve into battle anyway and she promises that her squadron will cooperate with Kyoka as no matter what. Yuki returns home and he is shocked to see that Izumo was there, Izumo teases him a bit for being nervous, but just then alarm sounded off. Himari and Shushu are out on patrol and they report the appearance of numerous gateways. Kyoka tells Yuki that they must help the girls and Izumo offers to take them. Izumo's ability teleports them immediately but Kyoka tells her to step back as this falls under their jurisdiction, she has Yuki transform but he can tell that she's in a bad mood. Kyoka takes back what she said about not interfering with his personal life and forbids him from fawning over another squad's commander. Yuki is shocked and she declares that he is her slave only, the two jump into battle and Kyoka starts off with the technique she has never used before. Shushu watches in amazement but Imari gets attacked, Shushu just manages to help her but they see that a new type of Shuki has appeared. Yuki attacks it but the thing heals immediately, so they will have to try something stronger, they use an attack called the Mighty Blade Cross and it manages to slice this new Shiki in half. Nearby we see that Shikoku is watching them and she is disappointed that her little experiment failed. She is just toying with them, and she points out that humans seem to like combining and modifying stuff too. Her humanoid buddy can't understand what goes on in her head but Shikoku just wonders what she should try next. The battle is over and Yuki compliments Kyoka and getting him all hyped up. Izumo returns home and declares that her life will no longer be dull now that Yuki is part of it. That brings the episode to an end. Thanks for watching, want next part subscribe the channel and turn on notification bell.